let me pull up this tweet from you, actually. So uh, Corey A. DeAngelis on Twitter says the GOP has a golden opportunity to become the parents party. And you linked to this, uh, this, this data showing that Republicans are now favored on the issue of education for basically the first time ever. Yep. Is, is it really ever? Yeah, well, according to this chart, it's going back two decades at least. And I don't recall a time of Democrats ever being uh, down on the issue of education. This is a seismic shift. It's like a double digit swing in the other direction. This is apocalyptic for the left. Yep. Because as we often mention, and I, I'm not, I don't mean to be crass, they're substantially more likely to abort their, their children. They're substantially more likely to give uh, drugs to their children, which will prevent the ability to reproduce. They're substantially more likely, just in general, not to have families. So as the saying goes, leftists don't have kids, they have yours. Mm. They need to be able to convert the children of moderates and conservatives, otherwise their ideology ceases to exist. And this is why Terry McAuliffe in Virginia had to say, I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. It's a deeply ingrained belief that the kids belong to the government schools. This idea that it takes a village. Well, it turns out it's a deeply unpopular belief, especially after the school system treated families so bad after the past couple of years. And I think the opponent, the Republican, Glenn Youngkin, tapped into something which could be a blueprint for success for the GOP and libertarians as well uh, going forward. Because how are you going to defend that? this idea that parents shouldn't have a say in their kids' education. Yeah, that, it's, that, a, it's insane. For any ideology, too. It doesn't Just because it happens to be um, on the backs of people that were, like, talking to kids about sexuality, it doesn't matter. You want to talk to kids about religion and tell them not to tell their parents, it's still messed up. Yep. You still don't do that stuff. We yep. have entrusted the public schools. They violated trust, in my opinion. Can you, like, real quick give an exa- like explain what school choice exactly is? Yeah, the money that would have followed you to the government-run school, on average in the U.S., according to 2019 data from the Census Bureau, was about $16,000 per kid. Wow. If you want to take it to the government school, you can. If you like your public school, you can keep your public school, but for real. But if not, about half of the funding or so, depending on the law that you pass, will follow the child usually to something called an education savings account, which the parents could use for private school tuition, for a charter school, for home-based learning options like a micro school, for example. It's the idea that the money follows the child. It's time to start calling this universal school access. Yeah. We advocate for universal school access for all children. You oppose access (laughs) to schooling for children? You monster. I I just call it funding students, not systems. It puts the other side on defense because if you want to fight against me, you have to argue why we should fund the system and not the student. So it's a sure. I'm going to call it universal school access. And look, I'm in favor of both universal school access for for all families. USA, listen, listen. A impoverished family should have the right to get access to the school for their kids that they think is right for them. Don't you? I mean, you don't think we should segregate schools, do you? No, and I think that well, there we go. Kids in incredibly violent dangerous inner city school systems should be able to go to school somewhere else if if the funding is there honestly you know from a libertarian perspective i say just get rid of as as much public (laughs) education as possible but if if it's going to be a fight to do that let's take every step possible and at least let these poor kids have a choice it's it's brutal public school is a brutal violent place for a lot of children oh yeah yep i certainly know that it's terrible yeah you were homeschooled right well Briefly, so before kindergarten, my mom homeschooled me, my brother, my sister. Uh, I think, I, I, as the story goes, we were homeschooled the moment we were alive. Yeah. Huh. Like, she was always, you know, trying to show us things. And then um, I think I learned how to play chess when I was, like, three. Not that I was good at it. I'm not saying that. But, like, I was being explained and taught the moves of a chessboard and stuff like that. And then when uh, me and my siblings, when we were going to school, we already knew our basic math before even kindergarten. We started with Catholic school, which was private. My family chose it because they thought it was a better school. And then hard times. Uh, after fifth grade, we moved to a public school. And wow, I think this is one of the greatest experiences of my life, to be honest. Going from this, this uh, private Catholic school, which was very strict, but um, not particularly harsh. Just it was like very rigid. Like if you didn't have your tie, you got a misconduct slip and you had to go home and get it signed. And it was like, oh, no, you don't have your little sailor tie. And then you go to this public school where nobody did anything and like you didn't have your homework who cares what are you gonna do about it the kids were doing drugs and then for me to be thrust into that I think was actually a really good thing because I had discipline from a private school private Catholic school then I got to experience the real world very very quickly and so I was like okay I don't want to do those things I see why they're bad but I also see real life Mm -hmm. so there was a net benefit to having experience 
from a more disciplined place and then realizing just how bad public schools were. I mean, I, I got to tell you, like going from a private school, which, you know, they have their problems too. It's not like it's perfect. And then going to a public school is like, I was not even in school. It was like daycare, basically. Yeah. Yeah, which a lot of parents didn't get uh, starting in March of 2020. And then you had some uh, people in the school system saying, I'm doing my job. I'm educating through Zoom. But it's like, well, if, but one of the side benefits of the school system is that you have in-person child care services. And uh, taxpayers want it, have agreed to pay fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000 per year. I would say they don't agree in the current situation either, but they certainly wouldn't have agreed to raise taxes as much as they have if the only benefit you were getting was something that could be um, done via Khan, Khan Academy for free. How about Zoom detention? Remember that? Yeah. Log I'm, into no. Zoom and stare at a blank screen for 30 minutes. And have the cops minutes. come to your house if there was a Nerf gun behind you on the wall. That I, happened too. I had Saturday detention once. I was I went to high school very briefly, and I can't remember what happened. I think I cut class or something because it was just so awful. And then uh, they did this thing where they changed our schedule. So we're in, you know I'm in eighth grade, and it's like seven thirty in the morning until two thirty is school. And then when we start high school, the local high school says we're doing ten forty five a.m. to five thirty p.m., which was like a huge shock to all of the freshmen coming in. So I was just like, this is ridiculous, and I left. So I come back and they're like, Saturday detention for you. And then I was like, what happens if I don't come to Saturday detention? Like, you get another one. And I was like, okay. And what happens and then, if I don't go to that? And they're like, you get another one. And I was like, I don't think you're, you're understanding <laughs> what this means. And I'm like, okay. And then I just didn't go. Like, nothing happened. It's nonsense. Even then, now Zoom detention is funny. It's like, turn your tablet on and then sit in your room, I guess. You're like playing video games or I mean, something. and at the yeah. same time, you had the, the teacher union board members vacationing in Puerto Rico saying, there's no way I can go to work in person, but I can be sitting here on the beach uh, tweeting out uh, photos on Instagram. Well, if it was safe enough to travel on vacation, why wasn't it safe enough to go back to work? Ah, oh, they're full of it, man. I, and, and you know what? It doesn't even matter. I, I don't want to have a political argument over schools with like, like teachers in the unions. I'm like, my attitude is, is strictly... You know, hey, good for them. If you like your teachers and you like what's going on, that's really, really great for you. I think we need universal school access for kids. And, you know, that way, you know, not every teacher is good. And so the parents need to decide, you know, what the proper schooling is, and they shouldn't be barred from that. So if you have a kid who's in a, let me ask you this, is it unreasonable? If you have a kid who lives in a poor area, the parents should be allowed to have that kid go to a wealthier neighborhood school, right? Yep. That's universal universal school access. That's what that's what we're fighting for for the underprivileged inner city kids to go to where the rich white kids get to go, okay. right? And, and if you look at the uh, the percentage of people from different backgrounds who are using these existing programs, it tends to be lower income families. Charter schools. You look at National Center for Education statistics data. More likely to have a higher proportion of non-white students, and more likely to have a higher proportion of low-income students. You look at the DC voucher program, for example, where I live, and the average household income of students using that program, I think, is about $28,000 per household in DC. 95% uh, of the students using the program in DC are black or Hispanic, yet you had the Biden administration coming out against uh, the program uh, with funding following the child. What's, what's their argument against universal school access? You're, you're stealing money from the public schools, to which I respond, the... Um, <laughs> The money doesn't belong to the government schools. Education funding is meant for educating the child, not for propping up and protecting a particular institution. Why should poor children be barred from going to the fancier, wealthy private schools? We should guarantee universal school access so the families can, can you know, get a voucher and go to the wealthy private school or the public school in the better area. Universal school access. Well, what's funny is the left supports a whole bunch of initiatives that allow public money, taxpayer funding, to follow the decision of the family for or, or student for higher education. We have the Pell Grant for low-income kids. We have the right. GI Bill for veterans. You can take the money to a public, private, religious, or non-religious university. It doesn't have to go to one particular place based on your address. We do the same thing with Head Start and pre-K programs. The, the families can choose religious or non-religious private providers of pre-K, and that's the funding following the student. We do the same thing with food stamps for grocery stores. You can take the money to Walmart, Trader Joe's, Safeway. You don't have to take the money to a residentially assigned government-run grocery store. What happens if uh, everybody signs on to this and then all the kids from the surrounding area want to go to this one school that's really good? It overloads their, their capacity. Um, they expand. Yeah. I mean, it's a good problem to have. Currently, if everybody wants to go to that school today, 
they may want to do it in their minds, but they can't do it because they don't have the financial means to do so when they're already paying through the tax system for the government schools. D.C. public schools spend over $30,000 per student per year. But like year one, so everyone decides to go to this big, good school and only like 10% of them can get in because they have 10 times the amount. First what come, happens? First do, is it like, do they have to draw a straw? First come, first serve? Do they raise the price because supply and demand? Well, new schools pop up. Yeah. People so, submit applications to open charter schools all the time. And, and schools typically will, will expand. So if in one year too many students are trying to enroll, they'll say we've hit our capacity. So we've, you know, through a random lottery, these are the ones that are on to come. We're sorry, but we will be expanding next year. So you can next year. But in the meantime. And let's say you can't or, go to the best school. You can go to the second best school. It's better than having no choices yeah. at all. Let's, let's jump to this. Uh, thanks for checking out this segment from the TimCast IRL podcast. But if you want to check out the full show live, Tune in Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. And if you want more special access content, head over to TimCast.com and become a member. Your membership helps sustain this company, keep our journalists employed, makes this show happen, and you will get access to exclusive members-only segments of the TimCast IRL podcast. And there's a massive library to check out. So again, go to TimCast.com or tune in Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. And we'll see you all there.